Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Qadawiyin Podcast. I'm your host, Sara, and I am joined today with three of my co-hosts. I'm here today with um, Aisha and Amina, who you guys know. And I'm also here today with Abida, who's um, joining us for the first time on the podcast. She's a new editor who joined the TQP team. Um, but yeah, how are all you ladies doing today? Assalamu alaikum. Good, alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Good, alhamdulillah. I'm from Sydney. Um, Australia, it's nice to join you all from the UK and from California. So it's good adding, to join the team. Alhamdulillah, yeah, adding a new time you. zone. <laughs> bring, yeah, know. and bring some representation to the map. Yes, yeah. yes. New episode. <laughs> okay. So we're back today with um, the second installment of our gender series, which actually began as an article. Uh, we published an article a while back on the concept of like women working, whether they should work, what does that look like? Um, a commentary on that like from Islamic sources and so we the part two that we wanted to do in this series talking about like mainly like common uh, controversial topics when it comes to gender and gender issues um, was we wanted to talk about the concept of femininity itself what defines the feminine what is the essence of femininity and um, what are some maybe flawed understandings that we have of that concept Um, and then we actually we decided to make it a podcast episode because we felt like the discussion format would just be better for the topic. It is a huge topic and there is so much commentary out there on it. And it's something that it's a very personal topic, right? Like this is not theoretical at all. This is every woman like in the Ummah trying to understand herself and like her her personality, her temperament, whether she's a good Muslim or not, is that defined by her personality and like whether she fits the standard of femininity. So if it's a, it's a huge topic, but inshallah we'll at least like explore it today and kind of talk about like, you know, the like, important things to know, the important things that define Islamic femininity and and the and the mistakes that we often make when we're having these discussions and trying to define it um so the first thing i do want to ask you guys is why do you think we're seeing more and more discussions about this it, femininity and masculinity i feel like these are mm. increasingly becoming like big topics in the muslim community why do you think that's the case yeah definitely i mean i think that that's partly just we as muslims particularly in the west being influenced by a broader societal conversation. I think that the culture wars that we're increasingly seeing dominate the political scene are bec- are becoming conversations that we're also influenced by. And I think that the fact that even those conversations are taking place, the fact that we have this thing called culture wars, it stems in part, I don't want to say wholly, but in part from the conundrums that liberal societies are are battling with the impact of them liberalizing societal norms since you know like the 50s and 60s is increasingly becoming clear and people's understanding of now very basic fundamentals i feel things like you know what is gender what are the differences between men and women how should we treat men and women like all of these things are suddenly up for debate and people are trying to really i think find um some key answers to those questions like in mainstream society And I think that for me, I remember really seeing the impact of this in the aftermath of um, the whole kind of hashtag Me Too movement, where they were calling out sexual abuse and harassment uh, in the entertainment industry. And then, you know, obviously in in, in other industries and in the workplace in general, because I was seeing so many articles um, of people kind of like genuinely asking the question and genuinely then trying to give advice to people on what is unwanted sexual attention in the workplace is it appropriate for men to compliment women should men and women be shaking hands and it was just crazy that you know people were having these conversations but the fact of the matter is there are you know very um very big dangers that are coming out of all of these realities such that now these issues need to be addressed um i think that as well obviously the lgbt discourse um is making people question very much particularly what does it mean to be a man and a woman um and generally it's interesting as well how most of this discussion always focuses on women and what does it mean to be women and it's interesting as well how women are the ones being erased from the conversation 
there was an article I think that was released last week by Margaret Atwood, the um the writer of The Handmaid's Tale, and she is obviously now being labelled as like a, a trans eradicating radical feminist, a tough because her article um was called you know why why can't we say woman anymore, and it was talking about how you know there are people who are much more comfortable by identifying women as people with certain biological uh, features as opposed to saying actually the word woman or they put x in place of a when they're saying woman um so you know to some people it is just aesthetic some people it is just choice to some people it is only biology so all of these discussions are happening and i think obviously in the muslim community we're not at that point where we're questioning what is a woman what is a man thankfully but obviously the lesser version of that is what does it mean to be a woman is there a certain code of conduct that you have to abide by is there a certain um standard that you have to aspire to and and obviously that's femininity yeah definitely i i think it is like um a modern problem and i you see this a lot with like as problems arise and like as brand new problems arise um the nature of like a lot of muslims to like be reactionary and then like kind of like a pull towards the opposite extreme, right? So um, when it comes to the like the issue of like defining gender, the more and more people start to like question the concept of gender. And I understand why it's like, it's not easy to, you know, look into the traditional sources and like find uh, an ex- like a treatise that lays it out in like bullet point lists, like how we define gender and like what constitutes masculinity and femininity because things that were like so obvious to like literally everybody didn't have to be laid out like that. So now that like something so obvious is being questioned with like, being questioned with terrible logic, by the way, like if you, if anybody cares to like actually try and have a discussion about transgenderism, like it falls apart in like two yeah. minutes. But like, that's the thing is like, now people are like, okay, wait, how do we respond to this? And so they're trying to like, come up with responses, but it like a lot of those responses are flawed. And I feel like a lot of the times they are these attempts to like create definitions and now like start defining these things either based on um like what they think is like traditional quote-unquote masculinity and femininity which are like largely uh, uh, in a lot of these conversations are drawn from like christian europe and like those notions of like the masculine and the feminine um or just like you know like very like stereotypical like tropey concepts of gender that may, like may or may not have a basis like in our dean necessarily but that like that kind of is sometimes the reaction is like okay people are going to question the concept of gender then we have to like double down on it and like define it very strictly and as soon as anybody tries to like exceed these um or to exit these parameters of like these definitions that we're creating well then they're they're trying to blur the lines between genders and that like to dispute that is to not say that like oh yeah we should blur the lines between genders but i just think that the lines should be accurately drawn uh, and in addition to that, I think that like why this is becoming much more of a discussion, I think it is it just has to do with the broader impulse um, to talk about like self and identity and defining yourself and like putting labels on yourself. And that like it manifests in all those like personality quizzes and like having a label for everything you identify with, including, you know, like your aesthetic or your men hedge, like you're not reading horoscopes to like understand and define yourself and like identifying with your horoscope label, like all this stuff. I feel like it's just, it's all that like uh, collective narcissism that, you know, in addition to that, people are like, okay, I need to like uh, package my femininity or I need to package my masculinity in a way that's presentable to the world because everything about yourself now is like, has is something to market, right? Your identity is an asset that you market to people, whether that's like on LinkedIn or on Instagram, whatever. But that is, you know, like it's, it all has to be something that you can like package and present to the world. And so there's more and more obsession about like, okay, how do I define myself? How do I identify myself? And like, it has to, there, there has to be like a value placed on that too, right? It's not just that like, oh, I do X, Y, Z. It's I, I do X, Y, Z. And that's why it makes me better than other people. Yeah, this last point, especially that Sarah has touched upon, I think in a general sense has been exacerbated by the rise of social media. And, you know, as we enter a more digitalized world, we have access to so many different circles and, you know, people instantly. And inevitably this will, um, you know, we will have to engage with them, even if we don't want to, even if we don't intend to, we will come across them in any way. And, you know, some people will even look for these spaces and, you know, dis- these discussions because maybe something, you know, that is something that their physical community um, and scholars maybe are not addressing adequately. And, you know, in the nature of platforms like Twitter and Reddit and Discord and all of this, um, nothing is off the table. And even I like academia too, to be honest, but the result is that you have an avenue to discuss these topics through any lens. And, you know, usually before when it was less digitalized, these um, like 
topics and issues were only addressed by specific people, people who are maybe, you know, like very much experts in the field or anything. But now we can have everyone talking about everything. And, you know, to be fair though, because we're talking about things like femininity and masculinity, this, this is something that everyone has a stake in and, you know, everyone can kind of relate to it. And our everyone also has an audience to it as well. So we have everyone's, um, you know, positions coming from everywhere. Uh, but, you know, social media absolutely transformed this, you know, the activist scene and ideology is pushed through, you know, this means very heavily. So we have feminism and we also have red pill stuff as well. But, you know, this is also kind of seeped into the physical arena now because we are seeing this in our schools and our hospitals and our jobs. And, you know, you can approach things from like a decolonial angle or from like a feminist lens. So, you know, we even look at things from a medical angle because these are literally things that we have to think about in these environments now. Um, and an agenda and essence of like, femininity and masculinity are concepts that are outlined within our faith and tradition. We are also needing to address it through the Islamic lens as well, because we have Islamic opinions on this and these are issues impacting our community. So we will have people talking about this a lot more. So I think it would be an understatement to say that we're facing a crisis in the works when it comes to our identity as Muslims living in this era in particular. Um, you know, we're faced with indecision and uncertainty about who we are and how we should behave. Um, at least, like, it shows in all the intra-Muslim debates, like you guys said, surrounding this topic on what an ideal Muslim is and what her roles as a Muslim, um, as a woman are, right? And um, what I've observed in these discussions on femininity and masculinity is that what it's, it's really important for us to recognize and develop awareness of language that we're, like, what language we have in these discussions. Because language plays an important role in the transmission of human culture and, you know, the formation of identity. And they already set assumptions about what exactly these concepts of femininity or masculinity describe in the particular language that we use to talk about it. And, um, you know, further in the various approaches that are increasingly adopted by like a multitude of women's movements or men's rights movements, which seek to reclaim what masculinity or femininity are about. For example, um, I've seen this very repeatedly now, very recurringly. There's this growing um, movement about, I just, when it comes to women's health, there's a shift towards um, talking about the womb and like, you know, women's cycles in terms of witchcraft and moon cycles and so forth. So I think the values, like everybody is, trying to find their identity they're trying to figure out who are we and what is it that we're like what is it that we're meant to do and you know um how do we process these biological functions that we have and um you know how do we navigate and reconfigure the social so yeah it's probably um because of our distance from um or collectively at general level the average person is distant from like sources of knowledge and um you know we don't have we're, not, we're, we're living out of our realm right um as muslims today so we don't we're meant to believe like islam it's holistic and we're thrown into this society where everything is um all the ideologies um it, it's the ideals that we have are we're looking at things from a lens of individualism and the enlightenment ideals and that's that comes in contradiction with the lifestyle we're meant to have as muslims so i think that's why everyone's trying to figure it out and the thing is we are liberal subjects in modernity so at the same time there's this massive contradiction we're living like we're living contradictions at the moment between what we believe in and how we are how we are surviving day to day yeah definitely and with that in mind like considering one like all the other all the things that w muslims are like battling while trying to understand like themselves and like trying to gain an accurate sense of self and we we've talked about like why we think these discussions are becoming more common what do those discussions often entail like what is perceived and defined as the feminine amongst muslims i mean i think your question is important sada but obviously to caveat it we do need to be careful of, of generalizing because obviously our communities are very different and diverse. And, you know, alhamdulillah, we have like people from three countries here, like and, and very far away as well, because Sada, you're all the way in California and obviously Abid is in Australia. So, you know, it, it's not about trying to say that all of our communities have the same problem. And, and we don't want to over exaggerate the problem or kind of get ourselves into a panic um, and whip ourselves up into a frenzy o over that. But I think that we can look at norms across different communities and societies that have somewhat become ingrained that you see Muslim women all talking about despite being from different places and that's always something that gets to me that regardless of the Muslim women I'm talking to wherever they are in the world they're all giving similar experiences 
So I think that that makes it relevant for us to, yeah, t- talk generally in, in, in that sense. I mean, I would say that what is perceived as feminine in the Muslim community is generally a more, a, 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 the image of a Muslim woman who is more passive, perhaps, I, I, you know, a little bit more quiet, uh, more submissive, all of those things are kind of packaged together as this is what a modest Muslim woman looks like, who, who knows her place, who doesn't kind of overstep the mark. These, to be honest, are often informed by social norms that are perhaps no longer dominant in the 21st century. Many of these kind of traits are things that have somewhat root, are somewhat rooted in the Islamic tradition, um, such as things like modesty. Obviously, we know that Islam encourages modesty in dress and modesty in behaviour. But sometimes these things are taken and extrapolated to traits that people should just have in general and there's not really a clear line being drawn there going back to what you were saying Sarah about the need for those lines to be drawn accurately I mean for example the fact that many people are under the impression that a woman's voice is is aura or just because in Islam we know that a woman's voice is can be aura in certain situations depending on how she frames her voice that doesn't mean that you know her voice in general is something that should not be heard unless it's necessary but sometimes this is what's conveyed in what it means to be feminine that you don't speak unless you have to ghira is sometimes extrapolated to rather than being you know something that protect a protective instinct towards women something that's about about chivalry and ensuring that women is respected it's extrapolated to no one seeing a woman no one hearing her name and in some cultures you know not being examined by a male doctor in a situation of an emergency like i hear stories of people saying you know their the other relatives in their family were literally their husbands are denying them medical treatment when they're trying to give birth because they are so angered by the fact that a male doctor is the only person who's available and if women are seen to kind of violate these norms very often they're condemned for that as unfeminine without really much scrutiny about what are the islamic kind of rules surrounding these things which are you know in 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 many ways kind of culturally determinant as well yeah so weirdly growing up i never really had these convos about you know femininity and masculinity and right now it's become a lot more of a formalized topic of discussion and in seeing these discussions in the Muslim community and just through the norms that we see play out, a lot of these descriptors of femininity, like I should mention, are like, you know, the quiet, the submissive, you know, the emotional woman and, you know, the whole Ghira aspect. And, you know, I think these are linked back to like motherhood and being a wife within the Muslim scene. Um, but, you know, whenever there are discussions of like increasing the negative attitude of the West towards motherhood or women working, the role of the mother is sold through the appreciation of women's, you know, their inherent softness and their emotion. So although I may actually be in agreement with this sometimes, um, but you know, if people actually do value women for these traits, it should shape the way they interact with women uh, and Muslim women on the whole. But I found in these situations where like a Muslim woman may have made, made, uh, may have made a mistake or transgressed, often she is responded to with such animosity and harshness that you would not usually do to someone who you generally do think is like inherently soft and sensitive and emotional. Mm. Um, and you know, how often do we see people mask takfir and like, do like condemnations to hell towards like the liberal Muslim women um, and these are the same women who are saying like Muslim women are soft and emotional and good mothers because because of these traits um, and when this attitude is brought up there are conversations about how we shouldn't like infantilize women or, or you know be lenient and it's not about being lenient but we should be consistent and sincere and more often than not in practice in our communities in you know the way we see things play out there is a disconnect and the hikmah that is applied to celebrating these traits of you know softness and sensitivity and emotional um that we kind of you know apply when we want to celebrate motherhood we do not um afford these women that when you know it's like guiding them to the half and i want you know like i want to add my characterization of women in this way but only to highlight the hypocrisy um whilst i do think women are emotional and sensitive and soft you know there are lots of other things as well and you know men are also within that category too but i think there's a bit of a disconnect between the way people um apply these um, qualities to women and then how they treat the same women knowing that these are the qualities they they have yeah i think that's a really interesting point actually um and it's so true that if women are all of these things why do we not see women treated as though they are these things these things are just used to kind of shut them down from doing certain certain things that they say that they want to do you know but it's not actually how you would treat someone who you actually think is more soft or is more nurturing or is inherently more modest or kind um that's that's a very true point 
Yeah, that's like I don't disagree with like I, attributing those things to women. I only once it becomes like a once it's defined as negative, like oh they're they're overly emotional or they're like they're so sensitive to the point that they can't take criticism. Because like otherwise, you can see those things in a very positive light, and the best light that you can see them in exactly. is manifested in the character of the Prophet so Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who absolutely. cried when he experienced hardship. Who was like affect? There's like it, it says in the Quran that like the suffering of his. Uh, of his ummah is very grievous to him and it's very grave to him and it's very difficult for him to bear the quran says that like like you might kill yourself from like being so upset over people of uh, over your people not believing right so that's saying i don't have a problem with those uh traits if like being attributed to women necessarily because i, I wouldn't i wouldn't define them negatively um but in terms of the negative the ones that are more often attributed to uh, women, it's kind of connected to what you were saying before, Aisha, about like, like if we see a woman's voice as like, Aura, I think it's connected to this, like seeing women as like inherently a source of fitna and like inherently impure. And the reason that they're like told to like guard their modesty and like remain at home and guard their chastity is because they're like this like fitna machine that like if they con- it come into contact with anybody, they just like create problems and like, you know, infect people and with like, you know, lust and everything. And it's it's this like, this is understood as like the inherent nature of women. And that's why they should be like, kind of like covered up, put away and whatnot, which like we can talk about why that's like, um, like how harmful that is and how it, it just doesn't also like, it doesn't fit with, you know, the, um, it, if that were true, it wouldn't make sense how the companions and how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam interacted like with his companions and how they did interact with each other in very respectful ways, in very, you know, like in limited ways even, but it just wasn't reflected in their actions and like in their social organization that they felt this way about women. Um, but uh, like we're talking about how like, yeah, we usually define femininity as like, like softness, gentleness, um, like being docile, submissive, all of these things, but I, I don't know if this is the case in your guys' community. I feel like here increasingly, um, like the celebrated type of femininity is the opposite more and more. And it's about being like very fierce and being outspoken. And it's it definitely, I think like a, like a post, you know, like war on terror thing where it's like the like Muslim women who are like constantly on the defensive are so like they- then, you- no, it's like, uh, okay. I was going to say celebrated by who? No, yeah. celebrated within the Muslim community. Like in really? the in the Muslim community, it's it's celebrated to be very outspoken because like the Muslim community has been on the defensive for so long that now being like a loud person to the point sometimes of like celebrating like aggressiveness, like, oh, if people are going to be Islamophobic and racist, then we have to respond with like an equal level of like aggression and things like that. And that like to it again, like there's a type of outspokenness that is very much like praiseworthy in anybody which is like you know speaking truth to a tyrant um like hating something with your tongue all these like concepts that we definitely have but it reaches a point sometimes where like women who are like by their nature because it's their personality are more reserved are quiet are more modest who like even like dress more modestly in a way that's not necessarily like required like when they wear niqab or something like that is actually people take that as like a personal affront sometimes they like some women actively dislike that and they're like oh why are you making it seem like muslim women are are like this like they they take offense to like people choosing to be and like just being by their nature like more quiet and like i don't know if i don't i don't know i wouldn't call it like submissive but like just you know like not being that outspoken person who's like you know, always ready to like debate or pick a fight or whatever. Like, and that the 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 reason that this conversation is tough is because like whenever you like criticize or praise one of them, it's like you're you're trying to like set one as better than the other. Where and it's like, I feel like that's the point of the like us trying to have this discussion, which is to say that like we don't have to like rank types of femininity or types of women like feminine personalities. And that sometimes like people's temperaments are their temperaments, and like that it's fine that they're different. You know, so yeah. That just, that reminds me of how we should steer our own path and be mindful of not importing particular particular ideologies, or at least being becoming more conscious. Like, how, where are we getting this idea that women have to be a particular um, sentiment? Like, are we really coming from Islam or are we, is it from, um, you know, cultural stereotypes that have passed down um, onto the generations and we're not aware of it um, and we don't really know what Islam has to say, but we're subs- we're imposing that onto Islam, right? And then saying that, oh, Islam demands this of women. Now, the question that we could ask is, are there a set of archetypes that Islam, asked, like, that, like our creator has asked of us? Um, so, 
yeah, I think there are questions there because if Islam has required certain characteristics that we are meant to embody in public, then okay, like that's that we accept that, right? We accept that as believers, but as believing women. But if it isn't, then we really need to we really need to like recognize that these ideologies don't really bear any relation to the vast corpus of jurisprudential discourse, you know, that is traditional thick. Um, and the, the different, there are different opinions even within the Madahib. So yeah, like we really need to interrogate and ask ourselves, are we like, if we are being genuine to um, Islam, are we, are we, you know, where are we getting it from? Are we really trying to please the creator? Are we really following the corpus of thick? Are we really, you know, are we really um, recognizing the genuine scholarship that has built around the Sunnah and um, the Quran, right, to tell us how to live in this society. Absolutely, Abida. I think that, you know, like you're saying, we need to make this conversation about what are, well, where are we getting these standards from? What sources are we actually turning to? And we need to be open about the fact that we could be influenced by foreign ideologies, as it were, um, on either side, but definitely, you know, in what we're talking about in terms of depictions of femininity, that comes more from uh, an idea of kind of, 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 of more traditional stereotypes, as it were, traditional cultural stereotypes. So I definitely think, you know, we need to be conscious of that. And something that I was just reflecting on um, the other day, I was found it super interesting um, when I was thinking about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about men and women in the Qur'an. And obviously this speaks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, you know, immense wisdom. That in the Qur'an, in Surah Imran, verse um, verse 36, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just says, you know, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى That the male is not like the female, right? And this is actually within the story of Maryam alayhi salam and, you know, her birth and all of that. So it's, it's it's got its own story and its own amazing meaning entirely. But I was just found it fascinating that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets this down but what we do not find in the Quran or in the Sunnah is a really extensive list about all of the differences between men and women on like a minute psychological level, right? And I was just like, well, why is this? Because ultimately human societies over thousands of years and spread across the entire world are so diverse and varied that they're going to have some differences in what they consider to be masculine and feminine, right? We have similarities as women. I'm not trying to say that women can never unite on anything and that all of womanhood is socially constructed. I'm not saying that. But the idea that we're going to unite on a certain disposition or a certain type of personality that is inherent to us as women is just really a very weak argument. And I feel like this is the real danger of being absolutist about femininity. It can be proved really wrong by anthropology, by looking just at the the, the history of human civilizations, and it actually makes Islam's position seem very tenuous. Insisting that being feminine is this, when, you know, is X, when it hasn't been in many other situations in the world, ultimately undermines the timelessness that Islam is supposed to have. And this is the thing, Islam's position is so wise, we don't need to be absolutist. It states that there are differences. You know, that cannot be contested. We're not going to erase that gender binary. And we see that in the Sharia, obviously men and women have different obligations and responsibilities and specific requirements. And we also see reminders, particularly in the Sunnah, to men and women about their behaviour in gender-specific circumstances, you know, so in marriage, men should be, be understanding, women should be respectful, you know, there should be mutual communication and, and, and love in that relationship, etc, etc. In inheritance, men have this particular, you know, amount that they're supposed to get, women have that. But what we don't see is a universally applicable culture of femininity emerging from that. There are red lines, but we don't have an exact blueprint. And it's when people try and create that blueprint that we end up excluding Muslim women who don't fit that criteria. Yeah, I think one example that really illustrates like, how do we, um, like, what does that system look like where it has parameters and at the same time allows for variation variety? I thought an interesting example was like, um the like the concept of tashabbuh which is like um and tashabbuh being blameworthy and haram which is um imitating people of the opposite gender and it's tashabbuh is also like used to discuss like um 
imitating people of like other religions and how like that's impermissible but when it comes to like um how like men and women are not supposed to like dress like each other or like imitate each other it usually has to do with like physical appearance and everything the thing is that like off or like local custom and local culture determines like what counts as to shabba to an extent so there are like like kind of like set in stone things that like women have their hijab and like men have a different hijab and that like um like longer hair is encouraged for women in general and like shorter hair is encouraged for men but then in terms of like in the US or like I don't know in Algeria what counts as like tashabba is going to be different to an extent because like what men typically wear in that society what women typically wear in that society is a bit different um one interesting thing that like I remember um when it like in the um in like fiqh books when you get to like when you start talking about like wudu and ghusl and like when you have to take a bath like after being in a like a state of janaba like how the hair is supposed i mean how how the water is supposed to reach like the roots of your hair right and in like a uh, hanafi fiqh text it says that like um it's excused for women who have like their hair in braids to just keep their hair in braids like they don't have to undo all of their braids to make sure ha- the water gets everywhere um because like you know it's like this is a common hairstyle for women it's okay for them to keep their braids in but then the book says like it's not this is not this excuse is not made for men versus i remember when i was like listening to a han- to a maliki fiqh lecture about ghusl um the sheikh was saying that like like both men and women could keep their hair in braids when it comes to like doing ghusl maybe because like the maliki madhab like spread more like in north and west africa so like the, those are places where like braiding hair is common for both men and women um So yeah like that like that's an example I think of like how there are parameters there are limits and at the same time it allows for like natural differences that arise and like social differences that are like that just genuinely exist um without setting them as like more authoritative than like what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said um and at the and another example too is how um when like one time a sahabiya radhiyallahu anha came to ask the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam a question about menstruation and like about how to purify afterwards um and aisha radhiyallahu anha was sitting there with them and afterwards aisha says um she praises the women of the ansar she's like the women of ansar are like she she just compliments them and says that like haya modesty has not stopped them from asking questions uh you fuck the nafidin i think is the wording so that they can gain understanding of the religion for one thing she doesn't say the woman lacked haya and that's why she asked the question she says haya didn't stop her so that means the woman had haya and she asked the question about like about haid to the prophet so i said i'm who like you have more reverence for him than anybody else right and like asking him those questions doesn't mean that she had a lack of reverence for him but also that there was like a different culture amongst the ansari women than there was against the like the women of the muhajirin now does it, like does this go on to like you know do we start interpreting this as like the ansari women all being better than all the like muhajira women the thing is like in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises both the muhajirin and the ansar repeatedly so there's variation perhaps in their cultures and like their general temperaments but they're both examples of like they both compose the the greatest generation to ever live See, I think Sara, you know that last example is so poignant. The fact that, you know, variation exists and is natural and it's kind of crazy when you think that we're having to justify this when it comes when it comes to women because in any other circumstance no one would think twice. But it's crazy that I've even met Muslim women who, you know, subhanallah, people make the judgment on them that oh perhaps like they're lesbian or something because they aren't typically girly they're what you know you would call tomboys and it's really interesting actually there's um i mean this is kind of a side discussion but the erasure of women being anything other than girly is actually playing into the the the, the trans agenda i don't know if people realize how when you try and define femininity and masculinity in absolutes it gives people legitimacy when they say but i don't feel like that i feel like this i like shoes i like pink i like fashion therefore i must be a woman in cement you know it's 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 just ridiculous um and and a complete reduction of womanhood that's 100% granted but ultimately if we in the community are starting to make women feel like that when we're already in a societal environment that is encouraging people to think about their gender and to choose their gender how is it how are you going to feel as like a 14 15 year old girl who is being told this is being rebuked for not being feminine rebuked for the kind of interests that she has and then somebody asks you at school you know teachers um healthcare professionals 
you know, do you, are you sure that you're a girl? Would you prefer to self-identify something different? This is something like, you know, a sister in my community recently had an issue with that, you know, she approached my family and she was like, how, you know, how can we deal with this? Because I'm a bit worried that she's going to go down this route because she's getting rebuked for that. So I, I just think that we need to recognize that, you know, as I said earlier, obviously gender is not it is is not socially constructed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, 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 has laid out clear differences between the two sexes, but certain things are going to be socially constructed in any society. And again, the Muslims get really scared at this term. They think that you're saying that there's no absolute truth. But I actually find it reassuring in that we can identify the things that we as human beings, flawed and limited as we are, the things that we create and impose on ourselves versus the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established as certain. So yes, pink being a girl's colour and blue being a boy's colour is socially constructed. We can say that without then advocating that men and women should dress the same, like you were saying, Sara, because we know that they shouldn't, right? We can be nuanced. We don't need to like be scared of being dragged down a rabbit hole. We can acknowledge also how certain traits have become more feminized over time because of sociocultural reasons. And, and you know, this is true even of, of, of work. I mean, this is a completely different conversation and one that obviously we addressed in our previous article. But the way in which certain types of work have become feminized is, is not, again, just because it, it's, it's not like this was a natural part of women's femininity. Therefore, it was, uh, you, you know, women have always been in these professions. Women have always been in certain professions, but the dominance of women now is a new thing. So in teaching, in you know, definitely in the West, it was not ever a profession that was dominated by women. In fact, women were held back from being teachers for a very long period of time, and then they could only teach women. And now, you know, we have a, m- most teachers are women, and it's a very feminized profession, as we know. Also, obviously, tailoring and factory work. These are very feminized positions now. And I'm not saying that they're great positions that we should be encouraging women to go into. But the point is that they that wasn't always the case. So cultural and economic factors have changed and have played a part in pushing women into these things. There's it, it, it's not absolute. We need to appreciate that reality and not only look at kind of just one dimension in this conversation, which is like, oh, Islam fiqh says this, therefore this is how it is. Or biology says this, therefore this is how it is. We need to look at everything in tandem. Um, I think the sociocultural point you made is very important because what these rigid definitions and groupings often do is place like disproportional focus on certain aspects and groups. Women are suited to be mothers, sure. Yeah, fine. Uh, but that does not make, you know, like caring and nurturing and raising children to be traits exclusive to mothers and women. We have so many like awesome stories and, you know, like examples in our tradition, our religion of men being brilliant fathers, you know, of nurturing and caring for their kids. We have the examples of like, you know, Prophet Ibrahim and Is- Prophet Ismail, and, you know, Prophet Yaqub and Prophet Yusuf and that close bond they had where, you know, Yusuf Ali Islam would speak so freely to his father, his concerns and you know the dream he had and the prophets of all and you know fatima like he was so loving and affectionate to her he you know the way he cared for her and if we look at the relationships between fathers and sons today subhanallah it's it's an issue i um, mean you know, how distant they often are the lack of an emotional bond you know i mean this is like a cross-culture thing this is you know like a symptom like a product of modernity maybe and i'm not arguing for a complete flip where you know men stay at home and raise children and the women work because there are specific responsibilities but then if we are to look at examples from the deen and tradition, why do we not highlight these traits that also also should be present in a father and see this as a crisis of like masculinity and, you know, like fatherhood? Because, you know, women working, it seems like, a you know, a very male thing. Women try to be men and that's like a, an attack on the family unit. But the absence of a father, you know, like because he's working much like very noble, like like 12 hours a day to care for his family. Um, and he's not present in their lives. He has no emotional bond with them. Why is that not a problem as well? And then why do we apply exclusivity to certain traits that essentially should be for, you know, every believer and for the benefit of, you know, the family and the community and as a whole? Maybe it's like kind of a simplistic way to present it, but I do think it helps us understand like the the idea of culture and alf and custom to like see it as how like, yes, like there's um, like variation exists and also Panatad himself like says that he created us that way, like for a purpose. Um, and that like that that variation is not stamped out insofar as it doesn't contradict the universal like principles and rulings of Islam. So that said, a, something that we hear a lot is that when we come across differences in fiqh, um, so rulings that pertain specifically to women or specifically to men, a lot of times when it comes to these rulings, people try to explain the reason for the ruling or the wisdom behind the ruling as having to do, like so having something to do with 
like the nature of women and with femininity. So is that accurate or is there a different way to look at it? Yeah, I think that this is definitely quite a dangerous trend. And I can't even say that it's a modern trend because subhanAllah, you see, even when you look at the writings, um, you know, of certain scholars in the past, that often they've become influenced by cultural perspectives on women and have attempted to use a hadith, um, and it's like some of which were completely fabricated in order to support their perspectives. Hadith like, you know, oh, you know, you should like take women's advice and always do the opposite. This idea that stemmed from the fact that, oh, women are intellectually deficient. And then in other cultures, women were perceived as just being completely irrational and emotional. And hence, people started trying to find prophetic um, justifications to hold these perspectives towards women. And like you said, Sarah, it really makes women and their inherent femininity the reason for these differences in fiqh as opposed to other extenuating circumstances or as opposed to actually just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom and this is problematic I think because it really leads to just a a lower opinion of women in general like we can look at certain hadith or fiqh and appreciate that there are gender differences right in this whole conversation no one is trying to erase the gender binary but where people start attributing intentions that are not stated within those sources and try and extract those interpretations from them and make it a generalized statement about women that's problematic and it's it's really frustrating to see this emerge even in just jokes about you know women being emotional or less intelligent and Eventually, I personally do think this leads to a perception of women being unequal. And I'm not saying unequal as as in different, yeah? Equal does equal in Islam should not mean sameness. We can appreciate that. I mean unequal in that women are actually lesser in many ways, which is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam very much stood against and affirmed women's spiritual equality alongside men. So this is something that I think we kind of really need to push back against. And it was interesting. Um, I was listening to a lecture recently by um, Dr. Selene Ibrahim, who on the topic of the hijab, something that's obviously very clearly women centric in fiqh. She talked about she talks about how obviously people try and attribute this to women's inherent immodesty or obviously the you know the, there's a degree of temptation that, yes, women have um, over men in, in, in that sense. So not aside from that, but just women as temptresses, essentially, and people trying to cast women as that. And that's why you have to wear hijab, because you're just a temptation and you're just, a, you know, a complete fitna for men. Not a fitna as in a trial, but a fitna as in something bad, something negative, right? But she was very interestingly highlighting in this lecture that chastity is actually encouraged for men and women equally, with this one small exception of hijab, where women are told to take extra precaution. And she actually highlights that in the verse, women are told to take this extra precaution and fortify themselves. And that the Qur'an actually actually uses the same word for fortress as it does in, in, in this particular reference to women donning their hijab and their jilbab and, and, and their cloak around them and this actually you know when you think of a fortress you think about people protecting themselves from an external force right so really rather than talking about the inner state of women this is talking about a threat that is coming to them from men if we wanted to now start making this as a big generalized thing about men that men are inherently you know abusive or derogatory towards women People would really not stand for that, I think. And I'm not suggesting that that is how we should understand it. But it definitely does point to the fact that just women in general are have this difference in society. Yes, but that's not something that's inherently their fault. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think in these conversations about gender specific fiqh rulings, what it really comes down to is um, an attempt to understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he does, specifically Why did he create men and women differently? Why did he make differences in his creation? And then why did he legislate some things for women and not for men and vice versa? And the first thing that's important to understand and that every Muslim fundamentally believes because it's a definition of submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do whatever he wants and it's right for him to do whatever he wants. It's whatever he does is good and it is wise because by definition of who he is, he's the creator of all things. So all things belong to him. He can do with his creation whatever he wants and whatever he does is the most just and merciful and wise thing because of who he is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first of all, that's established that like 
if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to create some people in a certain way, if he wants to create men and women differently, if he wants to legislate some things for women and other things for men, that's completely, there, there's no like moral question there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right to do whatever he wants and whatever he does is good. But then there's the like the natural human thing to do is to then ask, well, okay, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create those differences? And why did he legislate those differences? And when it comes to understanding the why, I feel like in English, it's like one question, right? It's just why did Allah legislate this or why did Allah create this? But when it comes to understanding the fiqh rulings in the language of usul al-fiqh, there's like two kind of distinct things um, that we often mix up. The first one is the illa of the ruling or what we can call the reason for the ruling. Um, and that's something that has to be like very obvious because that's how we know what the ruling is. That's the reason for for it's the something some action or whatever being either haram or halal or obligatory or anything else so for example the reason the ida for wine being haram is that it's intoxicating the reason for something like hijab being obligatory is it's simply that something that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly legislates in the quran that women need to cover themselves a certain way and that it applies to all of the believing women and then there's also like a consensus amongst the companions that like you know that they understand how hijab is meant to be worn and that's what, how we know the specifics of how it's meant to be worn and you know that clothes should be like opaque and loose and whatever but then there's this other thing which is maybe the core of these conversations which is the hikmah of the ruling or the wisdom of the ruling and this is something that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might actually tell us like he sometimes he does say for example about hijab allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that hijab Hijab makes uh, Muslim women known and it protects us from being harmed because, you know, when a, a when a Muslim woman is known to belong to the Muslim community, it's kind of like a an indicator to people that, okay, she has a community backing her up. She has her people. She's protected by them. Um, but that's a wisdom of the ruling. It's not a reason for the ruling in the sense that if that didn't exist, let's say there's a situation where hijab doesn't really protect the Muslim woman from being harmed. It doesn't change the relevance or the obligation of the hijab because the illa hasn't changed. But yeah, when it comes to then, you know, like trying to understand the wisdoms, it's a it's a good thing to do also for was for p- human beings, for Muslims to try to understand um like the wisdom behind what why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does something. What's the benefit that I get from following the sharia and what are the harms that are prevented by following the sharia? But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't state the wisdom himself, which he may not, if the Prophet sallallahu doesn't state it, then uh, our attempts as human beings to extrapolate those wisdoms are fine that, that we can do that but they are not necessarily authoritative um and it becomes a problem when people try to extrapolate wisdoms which is really them like some often trying to extrapolate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's intention behind a ruling in a way that is demeaning to women in a way that contradicts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's you know his statements about how he honored human beings and how he created them in a beautiful way it contradicts the prophet sallallahu statements uh, about praising women and about how he loved his like not only his wives but the female companions and his praises for them for example when it comes to hijab trying to um declare that the reason that hijab is different also for women than it is for men is because well you know women are the greatest source of fitna for men um and they understand that to mean that women are inherent temptresses and they're just prone to like causing problems and they're prone to you know creating like fahisha in society and whatever first of all like that whole the thing about women being a fitna for men which is stated in hadith of the prophet for some reason we only interpret it that way when it comes to this um this you know about, about women when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that wealth is a fitna or that children of a, are a fitna we don't go then say that like well it's because all children are inherent temptresses like everybody is somebody's child that wouldn't be fathomable it doesn't make sense so you know that that interpretation is like is one thing to be questioned but also it, it's just important for us to recognize that there are these like distinct things right when it comes to understanding a ruling the wisdom if somebody states a wisdom that is not you know that that might be just like completely false or that is harmful and offensive and demeaning to women that that shouldn't mar our view of the ruling itself which is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so again the problem that I'm trying to point out here is not that there's anything wrong with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating men and women differently it's only problematic when people try to assume intentions on God's behalf that they don't have evidence for that go against other things that we know to be true um and that you know are that are harmful and that are just demeaning and have no basis and it's also important to note that even though i think it's important for us as lay muslims to like just understand these things in order for us to make sense of 
um, like the fiqh rulings that we implement on our, in our day-to-day -day lives, that doesn't mean that it's simple to extrapolate these things, that it's easy to extrapolate the illa or even the hikmah. It's not the responsibility of just like any old Muslim to try and do that, but that it does benefit us to at least understand that these things exist and that there's like a sophisticated process for analyzing and for extrapolating them. Yeah, and honestly, just knowing where we are in the world currently with the dominant discourse and ideologies shaping society, people will not let these points go unchallenged, and, you know, nor should they really. Maybe in a time where religion had more of a hold, you know, where strong faith was a hallmark of society, women may have had more patience with such sentiments. But in this day, you know, like with the increasing secularization of society and, you know, the act of demonization of Islam, there are, you know, sinister motives to literally stay people away from Islam. And now when one side is celebrating the diversity within femininity, you know, aiming to empower and instill confidence in women through these traits, even if done in ways that are contradictory to Islam, whilst the other side is weaponizing the same femininity and continuously framing women as a fitna and has a very anti-Islamic mainstream, you know, against it, because, you know, the mainstream does show Islam is very anti-woman, then it's no surprise that more and more women, are, Muslim women, are finding solace in other spaces. And now this is not to say that we need to reform and redraw the boundaries of what is permissible to accommodate modern values. Um, because there are some things that are most definitely, they've been, def they've been outlined very clearly and the boundaries are set in stone. But rather, firstly, just to act with wisdom, lest we push sincere believers further away from the truth, and not to create dichotomies where there need be any, or rigid definitions and requirements, because, you know, that creates difficulty and, you know, people, it, people will choose the easy way out. Um, I think the example of women praying in mosques is, um, works well here, because... Yeah, there are some hadith that show that women praying in mosques is permissible and was a normal activity in the time of the Prophet. We also know of the hadith that a woman's prayer in her home is better, and this also, of course, holds weight. Uh, but what this could show is how easy Allah has made things for women, unlike men who must pray in the mosque if the situation allows. Women have more choice and freedom in how they execute the fard of prayer. Uh, but what usually happens is people apply the hadith in a very absolute way, and this takes away the decision and the choice for women, and they physically don't accommodate the women by, you know, creating those spaces. And, you know, when it comes to justification, I've often had people in the Haya make an issue of modesty and their appearance, so, you know, in essence, their femininity. Because, um, you know, women leaving their homes, essentially, and, you know, existing physically and being seen by others makes it, you know, makes them a fitna, right? Um, and just to pray in the mosque is to, to want to do what men do, because we have made this into a very exclusively male action. So what happens, it creates this binary that women who pray at home are more modest and, you know, have more hayah than the women who pray in the mosque, when these are both very um, permissible endeavours for both. And, you know, the thing is, there are most definitely requirements, though, for women, like covering yourself appropriately and going out unadorned, as Aisha Rizalahu and her did claim that women would pray fajr with the Prophet وسلم, and would return wrapped in their garments. The choice was always there, their modesty was not at stake or attacked, and it was not demonised. Ironically, though, because this narrative um, of women not being allowed to pray in the mosque has been pushed for so long in specific cultures and places that, you know, now that women are asking for this right and speaking out against the unjust reasonings, it's almost being framed as if it's a liberal endeavour, you know, devised by the left and women are being, you know, impact, you know like influenced by modernity. But, you know, women prayed in the mosque time of the Prophet, so that's, you know, it's not even a, it shouldn't be a question anymore. Uh, but these social cultural norms are used to shape the fiqh and create limitations where there needn't be any. And, it's, you know, now that women are asking for more space in the mosque, this act of speaking out, an objective also goes against the submissive, docile archetype of femininity, where women should just, you know, accept things without question. And, you know, if the mosque... I just, I'm just thinking, like, if the mosque don't let women in, because they have decided that the feminine way to pray at home at, um, only, then these other communities will welcome these women into their spaces with, like, open arms. And then sometimes I see people tweeting something like, oh, why is this, you know, hijabi in this place where, you know, shouldn't really be here? Because your mosques are not letting her in there. So where else, you know, where else is she going to go? Um, I just want to say, even in the time of the Prophet, social cultural norms still existed then. The values from pre-Islamic Arabia did not just vanish uh, overnight. And, you know, so it did shape the worldviews of the people. And Umar radiallahu anhu, um, he did not want his wife attending the mosque, yeah? But he did put his opinions aside and let his wife go purely because the Prophet وسلم, allowed it and said, do not prevent it. And this is just one example of how dangerous our rigid definition of femininity and masculinity can be, and especially in conjunction with fiqh and with issues that could literally push women away from our communities and our spaces.
Yeah, subhanAllah, the fact that Umar radiallahu anh, let himself be overruled in his preference for his own wife because of that hadith really shows that, you know, nobody else, who has more of a right than Umar radiallahu anh, to express a preference, uh, you know, for a certain Islamic ruling over another. You know, someone who is so close to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and so knowledgeable in the deen. And yet he recognized that this was also a valid opinion and that because this isn't inherent about the role of women, you know, he's not going to overstep the, the the mark in that sense if that's something that you know he did why shouldn't everybody else also be capable of doing that yeah not only that but that's the thing the women praying in the mosque discussion is so interesting because like contrary to popular belief there's not even consensus on this like um absolute definitive like uh it always being preferable for women to pray in their homes like there's yeah there's some like who dispute that altogether and others say who that like yeah it's still like good to pray in jama'ah though and also that the masjid is not just a place to pray five daily prayers but that like it's a center of community but if anybody's interested there's also like a it's like a treatise like a short um paper or like like short booklet written by ibn hazm on like women praying in the mosque if you look it up like you'll find the pdf but it's a whole other perspective that like n- but regardless like no matter which of these opinions you take like does she like literally get more good deeds if she prays in the masjid versus if she prays at home none of these opinions lend to banning from women from the masjid altogether as we can see from yeah just like the prophet sallallahu alaihi own practice and then the companions and generations after him um but then i think i know we've talked a lot about like what femininity isn't and how we can't make you know so many claims about like um god's intentions for certain rulings about women why it doesn't make sense to you know like try to create a certain archetype of like the one ideal muslim that everybody has to be like and we've tried to deconstruct a lot of like the false notions about what a good muslim woman is at the same time we're not disputing at all that islam does draw distinctions between men and women that there is a such thing as like you know things that are virtuous for men and virtuous for women so there, there simply is a gender binary so with that in mind does islam say anything specifically about femininity does it define it does it say you know or do any of our sources like try to define femininity see sarah i personally don't see femininity in islam as all that complicated i think that ultimately it's about us being pious women for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that means fulfilling all of the responsibilities that we have as muslims including as well the ones that are unique to us because there are biological gender differences and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us different roles and responsibilities so yeah that means embodying the hijab and fulfilling our duties as daughters or sisters wives mothers members of society it means enjoining the good and forbidding the evil it means being forbearing you know having patience with test with tests overcoming the struggles and the difficulties of this life by attaching ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking his pleasure alone for me, that is femininity. And I feel like we as women bring with it something that can't be just nailed down as such. I don't know if I'm just being a bit kind of romantic here, but I feel like femininity is somewhat ephemeral. It, it, it's something in the dignity and the charisma of women that we bring to the table that is uniquely there, but manifests in all different ways. And that's, again, part of the beauty and the diversity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put within us. I mean, it's kind of an ironic example, but recently on social media, I've seen on Twitter particularly, there have been all of these tweets, I don't know if you guys have seen as well, of people just sharing like the feminine urge to do like something. That's the, that, that's what they've been saying, right? And they've been saying, and, and some of them have been just like really amusing and things I read and I'm like, oh my God, I completely relate to that. You know, the feminine urge to compliment every pretty woman that I see. Like totally, you know, as, as <laughs> what's the first thing we do when we see other sisters? Oh my God, I love your hijab. You look really good today. Your shoes are so nice. The feminine urge to, you know, dress up with nowhere to go or to romanticize your morning routine or to like, the feminine urge to want to go off the grid and so- start a self-sustaining life in the forest. Like, you know, <laughs> these are things that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, these are things that we think about. And again, these are context specific. I don't think this applies to absolutely everyone. And I don't think this applies to all women throughout time and space either. But at the same time, there are things that we unify on according to our context that we can appreciate but I don't think we need to write these down in, in a rule book and say that this is what, you know, being a, a, a woman is. This is what it means to be feminine. There isn't an archetype like that. So, I mean, obviously, I'm not trying to simplify this conversation, but 
sometimes I think, do we need to intellectualize it? Ultimately, who does this conversation serve? And sometimes we should have that conversation before jumping headfirst in and seeing that, oh my gosh, we have to determine this because other people are saying that, you know, this is what femininity is, this is what masculinity is. What do, you know, we think about it and kind of just, just overthink it essentially. I do want to say it quite explicitly because often these discussions maybe unintentionally go down, you know, the route of obscuring facts and, you know, dwelling in ambiguity only. But, you know, there are rulings and stipulations that outline clear differences within men and women too. And it isn't all up in the air for interpretation and debate or all like one big grey area. Um, you know, there is a saying that men and women should not imitate, imitate each other. And, you know, there are absolute rulings that men should not wear silk, men should not wear gold. And, you know, so these actions are reserved solely for women. And, you know, women must also abide in the same way and not shave their heads, for example. And we should be able to physically differentiate between them both. And you know, there are differences in responsibilities where men are obligated to provide for their um, families and protect them. And, you know, if they kind of relinquish this, it will be a shortcoming on their side. Um, and there, you know, there may be situations where there is overlap in the traits and qualities of both and responsibilities, but there are differences outlined which we must actively and intentionally abide by and enforce because it has been commanded by us um it is command for us to do so yeah yeah and see this is the thing i mean to me it shows that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put down these certain conditions if allah wanted he could have put down many right he could have said well actually women can only wear dresses men can only wear this it has to be like that women have to speak in a certain way women have to walk in a certain way etc etc but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't right which shows that actually there can be diversity among men and women. The point is that we should not intentionally try and be like the other gender. But if a man naturally has a higher voice, does this mean he's not masculine? If a woman naturally has a deeper voice, does that mean she's not feminine? Like, if we start making these, you know, very strong categorizations, we end up excluding people. So yes, femininity and masculinity, you know, these are things that exist, but it doesn't need to be a subject of kind of a detailed rule book in that sense yeah definitely and that's like as much as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it very like open and left it easy for people to you know like be themselves with, without feeling like they're unfeminine or unmasculine just for having the personality that they have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also doesn't like just kind of leave us in the dark he gives us plenty and plenty of role models and examples um and he does so like in the Quran and also we have plenty like um, in the Sahabiyat and the wives of the Prophet, so I said, but also other female companions that were around them. So what, like, how can we draw like a model of femininity from those examples? These discussions often conclude with this idea that, you know, there's very little variance in Muslim women. And, you know, femininity is always made to seem as if it's boring. And I often left wondering, like, are we even allowed to have a personality? But this is very different to how I felt or how I feel when I hear stories of Muslim women in the time of the Prophet. Because, you know, they all have their charm, their unique traits. So I find it really weird how there's so much emphasis on putting us all into this one box when, you know, they clearly very they clearly didn't themselves. And I don't want to misrepresent the great women in the time of the Prophet, but, you know, whilst maintaining Hayya and Adab, these women were strong, they were vocal, they were assertive, often, and this is not, this never, you know, this did not take away from their modesty at all. And, you know, it's Fatima bin al-Khattab who spoke so boldly and bravely in front of her brother, Umar, um, and who, um, in turn transforming the greatest enemy of Islam into one of the greatest believers. And she was a wife and a more sister and a mother too. And Asiya, who is the archetype of like strength and resilience, she's not coward to Fir'aun's wishes. And people will say that, you know, this is a very exceptional situation. Fir'aun was the most evil man. But, you know, variations of Fir'aun exist even today. Injustice and, you know, oppression, no matter how big or small, exists even within the homes. But, you know, rather it's much, you know, celebrated to this like simply patient wife who is obedient, you know, endured. That kind of narrative, but rather we should be encouraging people to take the example of these women who took a stand. You know, and then we hear stories of, um, you know, people like Musaim bin Kaab today, who more often than not you will hear as the fierce, brave warrior woman, right? Which in that, and that she was. She fought in the Battle of Uhud and in the Battle of Biyamama, and, you know, the Prophet explicitly praised her for her bravery and her defense of him on the battlefield. But there's something more that really gets me, and, you know, it's her role, is how her role as a mother shaped the context and the situation that she was in. Because she was not there as a fighter initially, she was providing water and aid to the men fighting, you know, intending to them in a way that you could say a mother does. And then there's this innate desire to ensure their welfare, and that you know, that could drive a mother to do the unimaginable. And as it does, you know, she picks up the sword and starts fighting in defense of the Muslims, in defense of the Prophet. And you know, she fought courageously, and she even saw her sons wounded, but she patched them up and she told them to go back 
to go forth and fight you know, valiantly. And, you know, I do not see this as something she did as a warrior, though. Rather, she, as a mother, she asked the Prophet to reside in all space in Jannah. And again, you can see how the welfare of her children is at the you know forefront of all of this. You know, the best for them in the Akhirah, too. And, you know, she was no less of a mother than the women who stayed back and cared for the children in the homes and in the camps. And her desire to fight was not because she wanted to do what the men did. Or was she taking on, like, a masculine, you know, trait or whatever. Um, you know, rather, it was all interconnected and ultimately it was to you know, please Allah. And maybe today our situations are, you know, very different, but we should approach women in good faith and acknowledge the differences in um, all of us and the roles we may, we may and can play in life, rather than remain very fixated on creating an archetype that, you know, hasn't really ever existed. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, like you're saying, you know, when we look at the stories of the Sahabiyat, we see all this amazing diversity and variety, but sometimes it's frustrating, kind of like what you're saying, Amina, that people kind of say, oh, you know, these people were the exception. They're not the norm. You know, don't quote Aisha radiallahu anha as an example. She was not everybody was as outspoken or, you know, feisty or confident as her. Don't quote Naseba. You know, she was she she was somebody who fought in a battle, but not everyone did that. She was very rare. Don't talk about Umm al Darda. You know, she was uh she was the judge of the marketplace, but most women didn't know about financial transactions. And okay, that's fine. But I just find it really interesting that and, and kind of crazy that this conversation is literally never brought up when it comes to the male Sahaba. No one acts like they had a universal personality. In fact, you have people almost trying to say, you know, I'm a bit more like Umar radiallahu an because I'm more upfront, or I'm more like Uthman radiallahu an because I'm quiet and a bit more humble. So why is it acceptable for Muslim men to acknowledge that the male Sahaba were different and to feel an affinity with one over another? But for some for some reason, when we start saying that about Muslim women, it's so revolutionary and it shows that we're trying to be the exception as opposed to the norm, rather than perhaps acknowledging that in many ways, times have changed perhaps the exception then is more close to the norm now you know someone like Khadija radiallahu anha yes being a businesswoman was the exception uh, at her time but in this day and age when it's so much easier to get an education run a business work in a perhaps halal environment or from home more women you know resonate with her example than perhaps in the past w- w- what is the problem with that even when we look at the Quran again in that lecture by Dr. Selina Ibrahim she talks about how female embodiment in the Quran is very much related to typical female roles within a family you know the Quran deals with families a lot as wives as mothers during pregnancy etc but there is not a focus on women's you know personalities per se if if anything there is a focus on you know their internal spiritual state when we hear about Maryam alayhi salam or we hear about the the mother of Musa you know there's the metaphorical and the metaphysical idea of carrying prophets and the kind of tests that they had to endure that was associated with that but we don't know in particular about the kind of personalities that they had how their demeanor was how they interacted with other people that we can draw an archetype of this is what it means to be feminine you know even the idea that muslim women are more nurturing there's actually a lot of father daughter and father son relationships in the quran so the idea that there's a disproportionate focus on this because women are inherently more nurturing always than men is 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 not something that stands up to that much scrutiny And in fact, we see that as well, the Qur'an actually portrays many similarities between men and women. We see that Maryam alayhi salam says the exact same thing as Yusuf alayhi salam when Jibreel enters enters her room and, you know, is about to inform her, obviously, the fact that she's going to be um, carrying Isa alayhi salam. But both of them responded very similarly in terms of the fact that their first thought by being in a situation of khulwa was to preserve their chastity. The first words a female figure speaks actually in the Quran is is, is Hawa alayhi salam who is seeking tawbah with Adam alayhi salam. So this again refutes this pre-Islamic assumption that Hawa was more culpable in eating the apple than Adam alayhi salam and you know Eve was responsible to the fall and that's why women are you know inherent kind of wrongdoers in that sense. Um, even you know the, the mother of Maryam alayhi salam the wife of Imran she's the one who actively devotes her child to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we don't actually know much about Imran even though he's obviously the surah is named after him he is implied in, in that surah so when we talk about Muslim women and when we look at Muslim women in, at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam and in the Quran we see this diversity and I think that it shows many of the spiritual lessons that we can that we can take from these women about 
enduring tests, about having that forbearance, about sacrificing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, less about the kind of just particular characters that they have, that unless we embody them to the letter, you know, there's something deficient in us as as, as servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, I, I think the example of Maryam alayhi salam is just like, it's so poignant also because she's known as like the Virgin Mary, right? And this whole notion of like virginhood and chastity and modesty, it's... I feel like it's portrayed as uh, something that makes women meek and makes them, you know, like, I don't, just like sensitive and like uh, about to fall apart all the time because like they have no idea what men are. So if they ever encounter one, they're just like, you know, they fall apart and everything. But the way that Maryam salam protected her chastity in that moment when she thought that, you know, Jabir alayhi salam was just like some man was that she was extremely like upfront about it was she was like who do you think you are like you better fear God so it was something actually that like gave her strength rather than something that made her like weak and you know submissive but also something for me that just stands out in like trying to think of like what is like a feminine trait and how it, that's embodied by like um just like the the women giants like of our tradition and this is something that like theologians mention kind of like you know the whole thing about um like, I forget which scholar who said that, like, he, he wished that he had the iman of, like, the old ladies of Nishapur. Because, like, they just, they had, like, very strong, there's this, this concept that, like, old women have this type of faith that doesn't require, like, all these complex, sophisticated, rational arguments for, like, the existence of God and the creation of the universe. It's just so obvious to them. Like, it's it's so plain and apparent that, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in this universe and that we return to him. So, and I find this theme of, like, women just submitting um to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very readily and like that being something that's it's just very like instinctual for them um and them being like siddiqat like people who recognize the truth a couple ex- examples of that being first of all like Khadija radiyallahu anha who instantly like recognized the like the prophethood of the prophet sallallahu when he came to her and like he was terrified and like he wasn't sure like what was happening to him and she was like you're a truthful person God would never abandon you. This is from God. I believe in like whatever message you're bringing. And it was so automatic for her. And also um, if, like a little while after the Prophet Sallallahu had received um, revelation, he starts, of course, by like um, doing da'wah privately. And then he starts first preaching to like his um, his close family members. And there's like a couple of instances where there's like a dinner going on basically with his family. Um, and he stands up to like speak to them about the message of Islam. And in one of these instances, first he he delivers a message of, to them. He's like, I'm bringing you this message like from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he cares about them because he doesn't want them to, you know, like suffer the punishment of hellfire. First, Abu Talib uh, stands up and he says, like, I'll back you up no matter what, even though and Abu Talib is still kind of like, he's like, I'm, I'm not going to accept your religion, but like whatever you do, I'm supporting you. I won't let people hurt you. And then Abu Lahab tell, basically tells the Prophet Sallallahu to like sit down and be quiet. And like, why are you going on about like all this nonsense? And then Safiya, the aunt of the Prophet anha, she turns to Abu Lahab and she's like, what are you saying? Like, why are you speaking like this to your nephew? She's like, people have been talking about how there's a Prophet coming. She's like, you know, he's, uh, there's already been signs of this. There's already been a lot of talk about this. Of course, like Ahlul Kitab had already had like some inkling that a Prophet was coming. And so, and this is why like, you know, there are stories like the one with, um, like the monk who recognized the signs of prophethood in the Prophet but she was like, what's wrong with you? Like, I, th- it, to me, it's clear. And like, we know him. He's like a trustworthy person. And then Abu Lahab says to her, he's like, whatever, this is all women's talk. Like, he literally says that. And like, it just it, it's hilarious and like ironic, right? Because to her, it was like, the truth is so like plain and obvious. And like, even Abu Talib, who like, believed in kind of like the truthfulness of his nephew still wasn't willing to accept his dean but for her it was like yeah of course like it makes sense and like she had no qualms about and she was willing to speak up like in those gatherings with these family members a lot of the most of the family members were had this kind of like passive like okay like we're not going to oppose you but like just because of like kind of like that uh that's sort of like family honor culture that they had they protected him like um you know, they didn't allow, like, the rest of Quraysh to to hurt him. And that's why they, like, so many of Banu Hashim, like, were, they suffered part, uh, they suffered the boycott, even though they themselves weren't Muslim. So that's what most of the, most of their reaction was like, okay, like, we're not gonna, you know, readily accept the deen, but we'll back you up. But for Safiya, it was just this kind of, like, automatic thing. So that was, yeah, it was just really interesting. Um, and also another example of, like, I, I just found it like so beautiful was uh, Khawla radiallahu anha. So this story takes place shortly after, or sometime after the passing of 
uh, Khadija radiallahu anha, the Prophet ﷺ was reported to have been like very sad and he was spending more time at home and people were really concerned about him. Um, of course, like she had left like a sort of void in his life. And he says this too, like when people are, were like, hey, are you okay? Khawla radiallahu anha asks him, she's like, I feel like you have this kind of like void and like this emptiness. And he's like, well, of course, like she was the mother of my children and she was like the, you know, she was like the rabbayat al-bayt basically. And she tells him, she's like, how about I... Like, do you mind if I, like, go find women for you to marry? Like, uh, can I go propose on your behalf? And he said, yeah, go ahead. He said, you women are actually better at this. And, which is so interesting because, like, first of all, Khawla was the one who initiated it. Who was like, let me find you a, a new wife. And then she goes and proposes to both um, Sauda radiallahu anha and Aisha radiallahu anha, like, to their families. Um, and also the Prophet I said him is like, yes, you guys are good at this. And what does that whole process entail of, like, finding... Uh, a suitable spouse is it requires like immense emotional intelligence right to like actually like figure out who people are compatible with because marriage is no small thing and like incompatibility in marriage can lead to huge problems so first of all huge social intelligence and also social adeptness like not being um awkward or strange because these it's a very delicate situation to like go to propose to somebody and then like you know um possible rejection or whatever so like the fact that he complimented her on that i think it was just it was very interesting and very telling i love that story sara that is just i've never heard that story before and it feels so relatable subhanallah but i just like i don't know for some reason just the idea that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam praised women even for that how often do we hear these kinds of positive reinforcement. I don't know, subhanAllah, that's just, that's so lovely. Yeah, no, it, it was, and it, it, like, there's, I feel like there are a wealth of examples like this, like in the seerah, and that, you know, it. I, that's the thing is like, when it comes to seeing these people as role models, I again, I just want to reiterate what you were saying earlier about how people th- try to accuse us of like, uh, trying to, like putting the exception on a pedestal, to dismiss the norm when, first of all, if there was anything wrong with these exceptional women who were like fighting in battles or, I don't know, being in the public sphere, leading the marketplace, the Prophet ﷺ would have stopped it. And also like in the structure of the Sharia, there is things that protect the norm. Like the fact that, you know, it wasn't problematic for a woman Sahabiya to fight in the battles. And at the same time, women are not required to. There is an obligation like on the men to like wage jihad, but there's not an obligation on the women. But there's also not a ban on the women. That in itself protects like this norm that people want to protect. So there's not there shouldn't be the, any concern about like I don't think there should be a concern about those things because like the Sharia itself, as long as people again are like uh sticking to it and implementing it, which is I think kind of the foundation of this conversation is that like all of these problems are solved or most of these problems are solved when people just like abide by the sharia like the rulings are there and then whatever is not explicitly there that's where people can kind of like move freely and like express their personalities and like have their variations and everything so yeah i I don't think there's anything like problematic about looking up uh, you know again whether or not they're actually unique like you would have to actually establish that like with some sort of evidence but even if they are unique why not uh, look at like see them as role models so having said that and talked about some of those role model personalities and also showing how like some sort of like uh you know diversity is uh, allowed for and appreciated within our dean how do we work towards in our, in our future conversations and in, in interactions with people how do we work towards a, a more inclusive definition of femininity one that's you know I think more realistic also and one that just doesn't reduce Muslim women to feel like they have to fit the strict archetype that some just like may not relate to. This question is quite layered. I'm going to make a few points about how we can move towards a positive direction in defining femininity without disregarding the tradition of Islam as our moral compass. So my first point is that we can practically work towards making sure that Muslim women aren't made to feel reduced, as you say, when femininity is being defined. Um, is by learning what exactly are the rights and responsibilities our creator, had, our creator has guided us with in the first place and by approaching such guidelines with taqwa in the first instance. And I'm emphasizing rights and responsibilities alongside taqwa because too often we see an imbalance when femininity is being discussed. What I mean by this is that you'll either have responsibilities, for example, to the husband being emphasized, to the exclusion of a Muslim wife's rights, where even a wife's responsibilities to the creator will take a back seat. Or um, what tends to happen is that a rights discourse um, is, you know, either weaponized or passionately put forward, but there is no mention of responsibilities. 
there can of course be explanations for um, these instances depending on each individual circumstance but at a general level if we want practical solutions from one angle we actually need to approach defining femininity as a sum of both the rights and the responsibilities without reducing such to only what um, a Muslim woman owes or is owed and certainly not by sidelining a Muslim woman's responsibilities to the creator where even her responsibilities to a mahram or um, you know their rights over her or her obedience to her husband um, they're with purpose like we need to bring into the con bring back into the conversation that these responsibilities these rights there is a purpose in them it is to submit to Allah and you know how can we actually know what such rights and responsibilities are in the first place well we should encourage Muslim women to methodologically study the uh, the vast tradition um, sorry the tradition of um that is our deen right the the quran the hadith so how can we know what such rights and responsibilities are in the first place well we should encourage muslim women to methodologically study the deen that is our tradition um, and that involves the quran the hadith the vast uh, corpus of uh, jurisprudence that is the fiqh with trusted scholars and to learn classical arabic as well the language of the quran and the fiqh is in fact a means to ground us in defining femininity and so learning the fiqh ourselves a means that when people without knowledge out there or um agendas when they're imposing a monolithic description of femininity that borrows from un-islamic ideologies whether that's from culture or for example you know um, newly red pill ideologies for example which reduce the muslim woman or are selectively picking and choosing opinions that suit them right, to the exclusion of the context, when they're decontextualizing op um, opinions or rulings, for example, we have a recourse in our tradition because we know that their cultural impositions of femininity don't respect the vast spiritual tradition that we have and that we have actively um, taken it upon ourselves to go and learn. And my second point tying to that is that we collectively need to be mindful of the philosophy of individualism and release ourselves from holding our tradition to the standard of contemporary modern biases, projections or frustrations we may have without dismissing that we are subjects of modernity and the various practicalities tied to such. We are, you know, subjects of this context and, you know, our, and I mean here both Muslim women and men alike our sentiment should be of mutual goodwill rather than one upping the other gender or refuting for the sake of refuting. If we actually manage to address all of that, what will actually, that will actually help us to work towards not only a definition of femininity that doesn't reduce Muslim women to the, you know, the selective opinions out there that um, certain ideologies or those without knowledge will put forward and impose upon um, society as oh this is Islam this is what Islam says that Muslim women have to be or what femininity is it'll also address a correct definition of femininity one that we aren't all arguing about that we aren't you know stoop, stooping down to a nafsi enterprise a nafsi level it'll bring back accurate representations of what femininity is and that's what we should be striving for not just what we feel like not just um what our biases or our frustrations lead us to not just because we want to prove the other gender or the other person um arguing against us right so yeah yeah absolutely Abida. i think your last point is so true in that so often these conversations just really turn are, are, are stemming from like you're saying either nefsi kind of elements or just being influenced by the broader culture wars that we were in as we were talking about at the beginning and i think that's we, to really kind of work towards a, a more inclusive conversation on femininity we need to take a step back from those conversations and reduce the influence of those conversations on how we perceive gender there needs to come a point where we stop giving oxygen to those debates because this conversation, as we've been trying to, I think, talk about today, isn't as complicated as, as some people try and imply. I think that we need to reorient our focus in having this conversation. What is the purpose of having this conversation? Is it to make a list of this is what it means to be a Muslim woman and this is what it means to be a Muslim man? Or is it to prioritise Muslim women's faith and help them be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfil the obligations upon them? 
uh, I think to do that, we'd really need to set aside this personality conversation and instead focus more on how we as Muslim women can you know, cultivate our character, especially with so many of the challenges that we're seeing at the moment. I mean, one thing that we didn't speak about a lot because it's just a whole topic in and of itself is haya, right? As and, and modesty as something that is unfairly kind of pushed onto women as everything they do is immodest, as, as we talked about. But obviously, haya in the prophetic sense is a virtue and is an obligation. And we're in a society that is losing all sense of shame you know, for men and women. It's so important that we as Muslim women don't fall into that and are able to really prioritize keeping ourselves in a state of higher physical, uh, you know, mental uh, state. And that is reflected in our behavior with the rest of society, not just in the way we look or, you know, by speaking in a quiet voice that is, you know, not, <laughs> is, is perceived as unintimidating, but rather, you know, acting with the natural disinclination to all kinds of like fahisha. That's something that I think we really need to guard ourselves against because there's a huge push for especially Muslim women to engage in that, to be seen as normal and breaking stereotypes and all that kind of thing. We need to have that conversation devoid of this onus that Muslim women, modesty is like the cornerstone of your character. And if you speak loudly, then, you know, you're not even worth wearing hijab you know <laughs> like we need to have that conversation in a space that can actually do justice to it so i think that alhamdulillah like our conversation today i've i think i've really benefited in just talking to with you guys and and us discussing all of the things that femininity isn't and how we need to deconstruct that but also how we can inshallah come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as muslim women and really harness the feminine strength within us to become pious servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, I hope that inshallah, that's something that the listeners also take away. Um, yeah, and that's, I would want to end with kind of like a message that when it comes to us having this these discussions, it almost always goes back to the fact that we are trying to learn ourselves and also like teach other people how do we best submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like that's the definition of being a Muslim. And specifically though, doing that with an eye to the barriers that are often set up to women doing that. Like what are the barriers that like we as Muslims or maybe our like external non-Muslim society create to us submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I hope that that is kind of, you know, that that's understood as like the goal of these conversations and also a message to the sisters who are who maybe sometimes feel anxious about like whether they fulfill like a, some islamic archetype of personality or that have like you know who feel insecure about their personality or just about like their innate nature that again all of us have things that are all of us have like an innate nature and a temperament and like a personality and talents that are it's part of who we are and it's part of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and do we sometimes have negative character traits of course everybody does but those are not things that are like a permanent part of one's personality and those are things that everybody strives to like purify themselves of and they don't define a person's personality so if you were to you know like let's say somebody takes a away from like I don't know, like maybe you're listening to a conversation about Hayat and you realize there is an aspect of like, you know, my life or my like interactions with other people that could be more modest. Correcting that doesn't mean letting go of like some innate part of your personality and like changing who you are innately because you can't do that. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you a certain way and all you're doing by like trying to fulfill Allah's command more is refining yourself and beautifying and kind of like like scraping the rust off of that really beautiful self that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you with. And also I just like, I, I love the like narration of Aisha radiallahu anha where she says that the the person who resembled the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam most in his like speech and his mannerisms just the, the way he acted the way he looked was Fatima radiallahu anha like his daughter so when it comes to kind of feeling like who am i supposed to follow who am i supposed to emulate the Prophet ﷺ is for us too. He's not just for the brothers. He, it's not, we don't have any less of a role model because we don't have the same gender as our Prophet ﷺ. He's as much of a, role, a role, model, role model for us as he is for our brothers in Islam. So look at his character. Everything in his character is beautiful and all of it is relevant for us and all of it is something that we should strive to emulate. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to um, help us in and assist us and give us tawfiq in emulating the Prophet Sallallahu in emulating all of the beautiful characteristics of the women that we mentioned, um, and to correct, uh, forgive us if we said anything that was incorrect. 
Um, and if also if anybody else has, you know, thoughts on the conversation, you're always welcome to participate through social media and everything. Um, brief reminder that this is the Qarawiyin podcast, but we do also have a website, qarawiyinproject.co, where we post articles. Interestingly, there's people who like only listen to the podcast and I think they don't know that there's also yeah. a website where we post articles <laughs> and that's like the bulk of our content. Um, but yeah, we are posting stuff on there. So do check it out. Um, and there's also a newsletter that if you sign up for that, we it's only once a month. We send you a roundup of like everything we've published that month and also a lot of um, other resources, stuff from like around the Muslim web that has been posted recently. That's really good. Um, sometimes stuff like book recommendations and stuff like that. So with that, we will go ahead and wrap up. Jazakumullah khairan for listening. Um, we hope that you all keep us in your du'as and we are definitely keeping all of our listeners in our du'a. Thank you again. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.